Uh, I was an MVP for a little while, uh, so I thought I'd tell my story before we start. What was everybody's first computer? Sinclair? I had one of these, it was a Commodore 64. I had it with the tape drive. Yeah. So you have, and, and what you, you have the little counter when you're playing the Hot Wheels game and you know how far to fast forward it to load the certain cars. And then my next computer was the Amiga. Who had an Amiga 500? Oh, yeah. Yes, right. We are showing our age here. And my next computer, my dad got me an Intel DX2, anyone had the DX266? Yes, right. And I used to install Windows on that using these. So before we, before we got rid of DVD and CD-ROM drives out of our computers, we used floppy disks. Um, before we had thumb drives, right? Uh, and, and so my first sort of real interaction with Microsoft is I won a copy of Windows 95 on launch day. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was 14 and I was so excited. Right? And, uh, and I've been a, a crazy fan of Microsoft ever since. Uh, I was lucky enough to be a Microsoft student partner. First in New Zealand. Any other student partners? Cool. Uh, I, I, I tick some boxes off, right, at university. And then before it was cool to camp outside the Apple store <laughs> for your new iPhone, it was cool to camp outside the computer store, because we had computer stores back then, for the new version of Windows, right? So I camped out all night for Windows XP. <clears throat> I was really into mobile devices. So I had one of these. Uh, I had a compact iPad. Yeah, see how it Rolling. Who had the dual PCM CIA sleeve? Dual PC card sleeve with a wireless card that was selling it, right? That was my first, I don't know if it's a cell phone or what. So my first MVP award was for Windows Mobile in about 2001. Um, and, and there was some discussion earlier about people changing MVP. I mean, I was every MVP specialty. Right? So I did, uh, uh, I was a regional director, and I did uh, 14 years, 10 months, and 11 days as an MVP, which means I was a month and a half off getting my 15 year disc, which I was very sad about. Uh, just a hint here, everybody. <laughs> MVP program. Hint here. Uh, before I joined the joined Microsoft with the Blue Badge. So, um, I've had a really great time working in and around Microsoft. It has, it has been my entire life from about the age of 14. Uh, it's a really cool company. Um, you know, and it's, it has been a really important part of my life. So I thought, um, I talk about the book that I read right back in the early days. Anybody read this book? Yeah, there's a few, right? This was a bill. It's quite young there. Probably about my age there. Yeah. No, a bit, bit, bit old. Um, and then obviously recently Satya re uh, released his book uh, called uh, Hit Refresh. And in Bill's book he talked about amazing advancements and things like uh, web browsers. Um, because the web browser was brand new then. Um, and high speed internet uh, at 5700 kilobits per second. <laughs> Did anybody ever use the internet at, at 2400 watt? Yes. What about with an orchestra coupler? No. Right. So I thought I'd pick out a couple of the new exciting things that we could talk about. So the first is to talk about virtual reality and mixed reality. Um, so this is some stuff that we, we're releasing, uh, and in fact there's a big launch event here in Korea next week. And so, is it Wednesday? Yeah, right. Wednesday, Gangnam. Who's going to be there? Wednesday, Gangnam. Big launch event. Yeah? Right? It's going to be pretty exciting. Right? Um, so, we have some interesting approaches to mixed reality, right? So we have both 
occluded or fully enclosed mixed reality devices. And we have the HoloLens. Who's played with the HoloLens? Quite a few people. Have we got a HoloLens here this week? Someone's got one? There we go. You see the gentleman down the front here? Um, if you want to play with the HoloLens this week. Um, so if, you, if anybody's got, anybody got a Rift or a, a Vive, Right, so if I set up my Vive, I've got about 30 different things to set up. I've got sensors everywhere. So one of the great things about our new VR devices uh, is that they do sensing outside in, sorry, inside out, which means that they actually sense the environment a little bit like the HoloLens does. Uh, so it's much easier to, to get set up in a new room. Uh, and then obviously the HoloLens is quite a unique device. Um, it is a full computer, uh, so if you've not played with one, it doesn't have any cables, it doesn't connect to any other PC, it's a full computer that you wear on your head. And the really cool thing about the HoloLens is it's basically got, your, it's like wearing a Kinect sensor. Right? So you're wearing an infrared time of flight camera, and that camera is able to sense the room, so it can map out the room for you. And so we've done some pretty cool things with this in, in APAC, and I'll talk about those shortly. And then we have our immersive headset, so instead of being able to see through the lens, they're fully enclosed, like a full VR headset, but much cheaper and much simpler than previous devices. So this is the, this is the Christmas present you need to ask your partner for. Um, because who, who wants one? Who's got one already? If you want to try one out this week, the gentleman in the front, again, is the right person to be seen. Um, but they're going to be a great Christmas present to have this year. So a few things that we do that are different. Um, we have a single development kit for writing apps for all these devices. So if you want to build apps, I'm guessing the gentleman at the front will be able to tell you how to do it. Yeah, he nods. <laughs> Uh, but you can write once run on multiple devices. The room sensing technology is really exciting and really interesting. Um, and so to be fast, I'll skip that video. So let me tell you about a cool app that was built in New Zealand that used that room sensing technology. And it's a story, it's an MVP-like story. Because one thing MVPs are really good is talking. <laughs> Uh, so when Sadia came to New Zealand, it was my third day of joining Microsoft. On my first day of joining Microsoft, we had a huge earthquake in New Zealand. And so when Sadia came and he met with all of the government ministers, he said, you know, what can we do to, to help with the earthquakes? And a discussion happened about how could we use HoloLens. Uh, so the DX team listening in thought that sounds like a good idea. So we, uh, we worked with one of our partners um, and they built an application for HoloLens for earthquake inspection. So you put the HoloLens on, you run around the building and it videos the building in 3D using the camera sensors and then takes that recording and lets you annotate any earthquake damage. And we thought that's pretty cool. So we sent it to Safi and said, hey, it's pretty cool, we, uh, we built it. Uh, and then I went skiing. I, I like skiing. And coming back from going skiing, I sat next to this guy on the aeroplane. And we talked about skiing. And I said, where do you work? Oh, I work for Radio New Zealand, he says. Oh, says I. Can we get some media here? Uh, so I pitched him on running this as a story. And so he did a story about HoloLens that we managed to land on the BBC World Service. So talking about this cool thing that Santi discussed, that we built with our technology and landed on the BBC World Service. Do you want me to go quickly to try and get back on time, or do you want me to go slowly? Go slowly. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's just good. Awesome. So, um, a, a long time ago, because I had an Amiga 500, 
<laughs> and that was my second computer. So a long time ago when I went to university, I studied uh, what was then called data, uh, information science. You now call it data science, uh, or AI or machine learning. Uh, and I've sort of got back into it recently. And one of the things we're going to discuss in my round table is how you can get back into machine learning or get into machine learning. Um, but I thought I'd talk about some of the cool machine learning stuff that we've, we've got at Microsoft. And we have a bunch that's very easy to use. You don't have to be a data scientist to use it. And then we have a bunch that's maybe a little more complex, need to have some understanding. Then we've got a bunch where um, ideally you need a couple of PhDs right, to really take full advantage of. So this whole spectrum right, means that we've got a great on-ramp for all of the developers in the world to empower people to do more with their applications, and we've got the really hardcore stuff, right, if we need it. Who's played with cognitive services? Almost everybody, right? So cognitive services are a set of pre-built machine learning models that we've trained on data that we have at Microsoft. Uh, and one of the great things when you own a search engine is you have a lot of data. Uh, so we've built some really great models and then we've turned those into APIs that you can call from your code. So if you're a .NET coder, if you're a Node coder, if you're a PHP coder, um, we provide wrapper libraries for you to be able to call into these, these APIs. And you can use our APIs out of the box or you can add your own data to retrain them for your purposes. I'm not sure how wide a range of uh, Asian languages we support. I know that there are some that we don't support well, specifically Bahasa Indonesia. Where are my Indonesian friends? There we go. Have you tried this? Bahasa no good? I couldn't get it to go well. Um, so, but, but we're obviously working on that. You know, if, if anybody can do it, we can do it. Um, because we, let, we, we localize our applications into so many languages around the world. Um, you know, so expect to see this stuff uh, really improve over time. Uh, so we built some cool stuff in Singapore with a company called Capital Land. So if you ever go shopping in Singapore, and everybody in Singapore goes shopping, <laughs> if you ever go to Orchard Road, right? There is a Louis Vuitton shop in every single mall in Orchard Road. I don't know how many Louis Vuitton shops you need, but there's one in every mall. There's also one in the big mall in Malaysia, but my Malaysian friends tell me that people don't shop there. Uh, they just go and look. Uh, but big malls in Singapore, uh, we, we worked with them to build a bot that uses our language understanding technology to be able to communicate with people uh, at the mall. One of the neat things about the new approaches to language understanding is that we're actually training them on content. It used to be that when we build language models, you would actually build a model of grammar. So these sorts of words follow these sorts of words and so forth. Now we simply give them the internet and say you can learn how English works, you can learn how German works, you can learn how they're different. So those are our super simple services. Fantastic to pick up, build them to your apps. If you're building apps, if you're a developer, even if you're not a developer, really easy to consume and do cool things with. The next step on the journey is to use a thing called Azure Machine Learning. So this is data science, but it's clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy data science. Right. Um, so you, you still need to understand what you're doing, but you don't actually need to write much code. Um, so it's a pretty neat tool for rapidly exploring and playing with data. And recently we worked with a company called Video Assure to use this uh, for predicting when video streaming services are going to have problems. So 
So Video Ashore was founded by some people from ESPN and Fox Sports. And their company helps organizations like that to predict when video streaming will have problems. And they came to us to help them do a little bit more with Azure Machine Learning. Uh, I find all sorts of interesting people using Azure Machine Learning who are not data scientists. So their model was built by the CEO of their company because he knew he needed machine learning and that was a tool that he could use. I had another meeting a week ago with a hedge fund um, who were using Azure Machine Learning as well because uh, it was an easy tool for them to play around. They were, they were a non-quantitative hedge fund, so they're usually not doing high-frequency trading, so they were exploring machine learning by using um, Azure ML. I don't know why I keep going backwards. So I can do a quick demo. People like a demo? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, let me find this. So this is Azure ML Studio. Super simple to get to. Go to, go to um, Azure and create an Azure Machine Learning Studio. I can create a new experiment. And it actually gives me a template for me to start dragging stuff out. So we have a bunch of data sets that we've uploaded already. And so one that you always learn about in university is the iris data set. Right? That's about classifying flowers. And so the cool thing here is that we can, if I use my Windows Plus, right, we can go here and visualize and that actually visualizes the data set for me in the tool. Great, so I've got a data set, and what that's telling me is I've got a whole bunch of flowers that are of certain types, and it gives me the dimensions of the flower, width and height of the petals and the sepals on the flower, and I'm going to build a machine learning model to work out which is which. Which means I'm going to do a what we call a two class I'm going to do a two class decision forest. So a decision forest is a whole lot of decision trees that work together to build my prediction. And the reason a decision forest is nice is I'm going to be able to show you what those decision trees actually look like. I'm going to drag out the train model. And it'll tell me what I need to connect here. So here I connect an untrained model. Here I connect the data set. I can hit run, and that's going to tell me that I actually need to connect this to something. Oh, it wants me to tell it what value am I trying to predict here. So I'm trying to predict, or I'm going to train it on the class, i.e. what type of flower is it. And this thing goes and runs the model up in the cloud. Obviously, it can run this model very quickly. It's not a lot of data, but it can scale that model out to many machines in the cloud as required. <coughs> and then I can go back and visualize that trained model and here you'll see what I mean by decision trees. So here it's saying that if the petal length is less than 1.9 then it's of class 0, if it's greater than 1.9 then it's in class 1. And it's going to build a whole lot of these decision trees by randomizing the data set each time. And then what it does is when it comes to prediction time it runs all the decision trees and takes the average output. A 
So it's super easy to build out a machine learning model using Azure Machine Learning. Again, you need to understand the basics of what you're doing, uh, but you don't necessarily need to write any code. And then the last thing I thought I'd share that's quite cool is another project that we did recently down in Singapore is with a company that works with Unilever, who make soap and detergent and things in developing countries. Uh, and they help to make sure that Unilever's products are able to reach out into all of the remote villages. Uh, and to do that, they have people who work in those villages who can't necessarily read or write. And they want to be able to understand how are the products and how is the product marketing reaching the villages. So we help them to build a machine learning model that lets the people who work there take a photograph in the village and we find things like products and product names and product branding uh, in those photographs. So hopefully that's a bunch of interesting things. I look forward to having a chat with uh, all of you uh, over the next couple of days. And the roundtable. So the roundtable, we're going to talk machine learning. So it's basically come and ask me anything. Um, I'll just have my laptop. Do we have projectors or anything? No. Okay. I'll have my laptop all gather around my laptop. It's a proper laptop, right? It's not a MacBook. It's a proper, <laughs> proper black Lenovo. <laughs> right? What I'm saying is that is that some of us don't some of us are old school and don't need to be hipsters and own MacBooks. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. So we'll gather around the Lenovo. The ThinkPad, the IBM ThinkPad, right? And uh, we can talk about machine learning. Thanks for having me.